Are you, you sick and tired of being rejected in sales? Well, in this episode, we're diving into how to overcome objections and why resistance from customers is actually a huge buying signal and something you should be looking for. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. On today's show, we have Nigel Green. You can find out more about Nigel over at findevergreen.com. He is a sales practitioner and sales expert. On today's show, he's sharing how we can overcome buying resistance, why it's a positive thing within the sales cycle to come up against resistance. It shows that the prospect is actually thinking about your product. They're actually putting some thought into whether it's the right fit for them or not. And we also dive into listening as well. Nigel shares eight ways that you can tell whether you're actually paying attention to the customer or not. And so with all that said, let's jump straight in. Nigel, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Oh man, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You're more than welcome, sir. No faffing round with this one. We're going to jump straight in with the kind of practical elements of all this and perhaps we'll dive into the mindset a little bit later on. But we're going to talk about ways to overcome client resistance. And where I want to start with this is, is there a process to do this? Is there a step-by-step process that we can put in place to overcome client resistance? Or is it more complex than that? That's a really good question. I have to tell you, I don't know the answer. Uh, I would tell you that uh, I have approached it uh, as a process, but it, it may work for others that they find that it's a little bit more complex depending on the sales cycle. Where I want to start, in, in the first step in this process, if you want to look at it uh, from a process perspective, is that in today's marketplace, you lose business more times than not to an apathetic buyer than you do to a competitor. So a lot of times we go into a a meeting thinking that uh, if we get a no from this client, it's because they're going to go with our competitor and we're selling against that. And so the first first step in the process, Will, is to realize that that's not what's happening. You are losing business to a buyer who, on the one hand, understands the benefits of your offering and they can see why they would do business with you. But on the other hand, they can see of all the reasons why it's not as important as other agendas that they have, or maybe uh, the pain to take action now is not acute or sharp enough uh, to then to just sit there and do nothing. So that, that's really the first step is to understand that when you're losing business, when you're getting a no, it's because they're choosing to do nothing. How do we uncover this? Are there any questions that we can ask to that? Because that, that is a very... How to describe it? That's a very direct problem that's easy to digest. But to get the person that you're sat in front of to understand what you just described, when they're perhaps not used to always buying, obviously we're selling consistently. Perhaps a middle management, perhaps a, a, a VP of marketing or whoever it is that we're selling to, they're not a professional buyer. They're not buying all the time. So maybe they don't even know what their priori- priorities are. How do we ask, or, or do we ask? Um, to to uncover what their priorities are so we can see where we are within them so that we can see, I guess, from even the outgo, the the offset, that we're not wasting our time with them. Yeah, so typically that's a a great place to start, and that's where I I would tell people to start. It is the simple, it's not a very complicated question. It's Mr. or Miss Customer, thank you for taking the call, taking the meeting. Why did you decide to give me an hour of your time or 30 minutes what what did what did you want to gain from this conversation? That's a really simple question. Maybe for uh, when you're trying to when you've had a couple of meetings or a couple of calls and you're feeling like you're losing some momentum. A question I like to ask is, Have you thought about working with us? Have you thought about what it would be like if we were business partners? What do you see us doing? How do you see us adding value to your organization? What what comes to mind? What is, is the goal of that to paint a picture and or allow them to paint a picture in their mind to essentially future pace and to make it more real for them? That's one of the goals. I think the other goal will, and I probably maybe for me, the more important goal is I think oftentimes we try to assert or insert for a client motivation to work with us. We tend to be more in love with our product or service than we are with the customer we want to have. 
Therefore, we try to give them some motivation, some reason, some feature or some benefit or some competitive differentiator. And what we know to be true about any customer, the human brain, think about your your kids. If you have kids, um, any not, motivation. Not Don't do it. Well, so <laughs> listen, th- listen to our, there's probably somebody in your audience that, that yeah. understands this and is like, Nigel, I know exactly what you're talking about. Anytime I ask my son to do something. I mean, it's a sales call. I mean, it's a negotiation. So uh, rather than me trying to give him motivation to do what I want him to do, I'm just trying to grasp onto any motivation that he might already have to do what I want him to do. And so we're doing the same thing in this meeting is trying to figure out why would you do business with me? And I'm going there versus telling you about uh, this new piece of software that rolled out or uh, some other way in which we're supporting the offering or how we've reduced the price or how there's a limited time. This is going to sell out. None of that matters. What do you, why would you buy this? So are you trying to make them not sweat? That's the wrong word. But are you, are you trying to make them think as opposed to I've been in many pitches where it's a real passive experience for the potential buyer, whether they're just absorbing information slash being on the iPhone in one hand, not really listening. Are we trying to make our buyers think when we're conversing with them? I think so. I think we are trying to make them think about whether or not this is the right thing for you, whether or not this is the right thing for that business unit that you represent or the company that you lead. Because I firmly believe that no is the second best answer. I think my time is just as important as yours. And I'm not going to come back to another meeting or get on another call for a customer that doesn't even know why they would do business with me. It's interesting. It's almost turning it on its head, which leads to the question, which I don't know if there's an answer to, but I'm, I'm going to ask you because I'm, I'm intrigued to get your insights on it, in that how do we know if our product is the right fit for the customer? Are we just trying to tee it up so that they can say yes or no? And then you've got the the age old question of, you know, when is a no actually a no versus when should we continue questioning them? A no is a no is a no from, from where, you know, my perspective, when, when a customer says no, you haven't done a good enough job uh, communicating how it's helpful or you haven't moved them over their stance of apathy uh, around your offering. So I I like to just take no's for what they are. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop. It just means that uh, there's more work to be done. And so I I think my whole take on this, you know, you ask when, how do we know if if the sale's done or or when, when is it complete? Uh, I don't know that it ever is. I think a yes is just the first step in a commitment because once you get them to sign a letter of intent or sign a statement of work or give you your credit card number. That is the first micro commitment in a series of commitments that have to happen in order for your business to thrive. Because there are two things that we know are true. A business is created for the sole purpose of creating a customer. Without a customer, you don't have a business. So the second part of that is it is far more easier and far more cheaper to keep the customer that you already have than it is to go get another one. So that that yes that you get when they sign the paperwork, give you the credit card information, is just the first of many yeses that you have to get over the lifetime value of that customer. So the work just starts, Will. <laughs> is this a, um, and I, I can give you context of the podcast and upgraded media, which is the holding company of the, the podcast and a few other things. But is this a mind sh- mindset shift that people have to make of, you're not, you're not there to make friends. Like your, your job is to drive revenue. And the only reason a business exists, you know, taking charities, nonprofits for profits uh, out of the equation here for the moment is to drive revenue and to, you know, in the larger organizations, it's to prop up pensions through the stock market. There's all kinds of trickle down effects from it. But do we need to make the mindset shift that our goal is, and it sounds so silly to say it to on a uh, to an audience of sales professionals, but our goal isn't to have an amazing personal brand. It isn't to do all these extra niceties that are being pushed in the world of social selling. Our goal is to just drive revenue. Our goal is to drive value, and revenue is a measure of value that you create. So you have to think about, I want everybody here that's listening, if you focus on the revenue, you'll miss the value. 
if you focus on the value, you'll always hit the revenue. I love this. So you didn't take the bait then. And I, I wasn't trying to like trip you up or anything, but you've you reframed the question of how I think about it. And this is the shift that I, well, there's two shifts that I made with the podcast of, and the audience knows this. So I'll just quickly run through it of when we first got started, clearly revenue to a startup, to a media organization like this is ad spend, which is you know crucial. Clearly I'm not feeding myself unless, <laughs> unless I sell some ad space on the show. And this is before there's an audience, this is before anything's proven, anything's tested. And then I got real comfortable for a good six months, maybe even 12 months. I was making probably a little bit less than what I was making in medical device sales, but I was in control of my time, uh, my energy. It was, I was speaking with legends like yourself, just day in, day out, and just having really good conversations. So I got comfortable. And then it was a kick in the ass from um, Peter Sage, a previous guest who came on the show. And he turned this on its head. He reminded me of the, I don't know who said it first. I think it's in Think and Grow Rich as well. I think it's quite cliche now of, Essentially, if you want to, if you want to make a million pounds dollars, you have to give a million pounds worth of value, and so that gave me a kick in the ass to put out more content, better content, to raise the production values of all the video side of things, the audio side of things, and that really got me motivated and really crystallised the fact that I'm not, I'm not putting out this content for my own health. I'm not. There's obviously it's great having an audience. It's great getting emails from the audience every day. You know, I get 10, 20 emails saying how much they love the show, and that motivates me on a Friday night. So just put that extra few hours working. But the goal of all this is to, um, and we're kind of taking different ways around it, but the goal is to drive the business forward as opposed to like, be comfortable with anything. And so this is a, a shift that I made in my thinking. Do you think that salespeople do get comfortable You know, when they've had a little bit of success over a couple of years? Or is that fine? Is that okay to be comfortable to work at level eight rather than 10 and to you know just not do your fullest potential, but, but have the benefit of perhaps a more relaxed role? Well, I think if we're going to get honest with one another for a second, it's unavoidable to get comfortable. Uh, I think it happens. I've certainly had seasons where I've felt uh, really comfortable. I think part of the issue, Will, is you don't know that. You don't know that you're letting off the gas and you're working at an eight instead of a 10 until you invite feedback loops, which is why I think if you're in any revenue generating role and you don't have a coach, whether it's a formal coach or an informal coach, but if you're not inviting others to speak into not just the, the quantity, the level of production that you're currently uh, existing in, but also the quality, how you're doing it. Are you treating people well? Are you, it, are your goals and the way in which you're achieving your goals consistent and aligned with your values? What you say is important. You know, if you value hustle, but you're uh, playing golf on Friday, let's, you need to have someone that can call that into challenge and say, help me understand this. So, I mean, I think we all go through those seasons, but the quickest way to get out of it is to invite feedback. Amazing. Okay. So let's, <laughs> we're slightly off topic there. So let's, let's rein it back in for a second, Nigel. So we have teed up the meeting of asking the, the prospect, you know, why are we here? Obviously I, I've made the, the outreach as a sales professional. I know I've got value to give, but why, why do you think we're here? And that frames up the whole conversation then probably leads to a few insights as to what their problems are. Um, we're going through the process. It seems like there is some kind of fit, but then perhaps as you described, perhaps the priority of selling your product into the organization isn't as high as the priority of another project that's going on at the same time. At this moment, are we looking to reframe the priorities in their mind? And I'm, I'm, I'm cur choose my words carefully here because essentially there's people skilled enough to manipulate and motivate someone that this priority is more important than anything else you've got going on is that what we're aiming to do subtly or are we are we genuinely just trying to fit in if this is not the right time right now we arrange a follow-up point and we come back and we don't necessarily overcome resistance we just negate it by playing the long-term game yeah good good question i think we're all capable of uh, manipulation at at some level I, I think really the essence of this will is challenging ourselves, challenging your audience to just be more effective at listening. Uh, what, what happens and where, where we really run up against resistance and we can't break through it 
is because we don't understand what good listening is. And, and what I'm trying to help salespeople and sales managers understand is that just because you are quiet while the customer talks and you've created space for them to contribute, that's not necessarily listening. It could be ignoring. It could be <laughs> pretending Right. I mean, we could be looking at our phone. We could be uh, we could be planning. Right. Thinking about what we're going to say next. And so really what I want to do is let let's understand the deeper levels of listening and how does that manifest in a meeting. And then the other part of that is at some point we are going to feel the need to contribute to the conversation. And how do we do that in a way that does two things? One affirms we heard and felt everything that they communicated to us because listening is not just about hearing. It's about perceiving the other emotions and the other signs that are going on by the language that they choose, the, the body language they display. And, and then two, so we, we want to affirm that we heard it. And then two, we, we want to say things that align with their outcomes, not redirecting. And so we, you know, we're going to get to this, but I've come up with a long list and then shorten it down to really a shorter eight signs to know that you're just not listening. <laughs> well, that was what I was going to ask. So I'm glad you kind of threw that one up for me to, to hit there of how do we know whether we're listening or not? And this is something that I work on consistently with the podcast of when I first started I'd be doing this, go these back and forths, and I wouldn't really be listening to the guest. I'd be scribbling stuff down. I'd be jotting where I think I want the conversation to go because I was crazy scared of there being a, a four seconds of awkward silence and everyone to think that I was a massive fraud for it. And I know in sales, I've done similar things of, well, this person's talking about this. Like that, I used to think that that would buy me a bit of time to plan my next question. And clearly you can't plan the next question and listen and really in, ingest and, and and work and process on what you're being told at the same time. So how do we know whether we're really listening or not? Let's start with, Will, some of these eight signs that I for sure know you're not listening. When, when you, and when the customer knows it too, when you exhibit these eight types of responses, it sends off red flags to your customer. And in a lot of instances, you lose them. It stands in the way of you closing the deal. So there are eight, and, I, and I'm going to run through them really quickly. And then what I'm going to do is offer up a potential better response, a more effective response. The first is telling. So telling occurs when we give orders. We try to direct the customer's next response or issue a command. The big distinction here is that we're doing these responses when we have not yet been invited to respond in this way. Because I'm going to get a lot of these uh, con consultative salespeople on the phone and challenger salespeople that are going to say, well, that's the whole essence of this. Yeah, but what those books and what those models assume is that the customer has asked you to contribute. Not, not yet. So when we say something like, you know, you've got a customer that says to you, I just don't know if, if we need new chairs. And you're selling chairs. So you respond, you've got to sit in our new line of chairs. They're so much more comfortable. You just told them to do something and they didn't ask yet if they they didn't ask if they could sit in the chair <laughs> so that's the first is, is telling scaring i hear this a lot in in healthcare. I, you were in medical device sales i still am very active in healthcare. they say something like uh, and this is what you do when you warn caution or threaten a customer so the client says we're really pleased with our current provider yeah but did you see the recent article about the lawsuit It'd be really easy for a Lyft person right now in the current headlines to go out and try to get business by targeting Uber. That is not a way to get business. So we don't want to do that either. The third is consulting. Uh, again, this, this is going to challenge a lot of people, but when you give advice, make suggestions, or provide solutions before the customer has asked for your opinion, you're breaking this rule. Another medical device uh, play here. One of our newest robots broke down yesterday during surgery. And then the rep responds, have you called the manufacturer and asked for it to be replaced? They didn't ask for you to be involved with that. So don't do it. 
Tricking, this is the fourth one. We trick when we persuade with logic, provide figures out of context, or just make up success stories. It happens all too often, and uh, I'm, I'm really tired of hearing reps do this, but reps uh, rep might say, well, we're working on some material, but I can tell you 97% of our customers see a 15% improvement, and everybody in the room knows it's a bogus number. So just stop doing it. And we're laughing because it's true. You've heard it, haven't you? I, I've probably done it myself, if I'm honest. Yeah. It, yeah. We, yes. It's not a good thing to do. And then number five is combating, disagreeing, judging, or criticizing the customer's decision. Uh, so I don't, the client might say something like, I don't know if the service is actually saving us money. And the rep fires back quickly. Of course it is. Look at last month's production report. Number six is stroking, and I see this, you get a lot of yes reps out there that stroke. When we agree, approve, or praise a customer, um, we're stroking their ego. We shouldn't do this, especially, Will, when we don't actually agree with what they're saying. So the client would say something like, we decide to pass on the opportunity to upgrade our software this year, even though it might cost us some processing speed. And the rep says, I agree, I, let's wait until next year to, to do the upgrade. Then we got two more, counseling. And that, that shows up when you reassure, console, and sympathize with your customer. Uh, and it doesn't help them solve their problems when you counsel them. So th this is how it might play out. Client says, hey, it just it hasn't been a good year for our division. Sales are down 30% compared to last year. And if you're the rep and you reply, well, you know, well, don't worry. All of my customers are seeing decreased sales too. You're going to be fine. That's not helpful. And the last one, uh, and this is, you see this a lot with uh, newer reps or reps that have a lot of products to sell and they roll it up into, into kind of one final end of the month or end of the period statement, and that is distracting. Humoring, changing the subject, leading statements are all ways to get customers off track. So you see, I noticed our spin on Suture went up 58% this month. What's that about? Yeah, it did, but your overall spend was down 3%. So let's flip down and let's show you that number. So th those, are, those are the eight types of responses that I see most often, Will, and they just derail a customer's ability to reach a resolution about you, the offering, or, or how we're going to move forward. A lot of this, and you have to excuse my French, and I know this is my way of describing it and not yours, but a lot of this is just don't be a dick, right? It's... Um, it's uh, probably seven out of the eight that you described it's you it, it you wouldn't treat a best mate like that but you might treat someone that you don't really care about like that someone that's on the fringe that you, you're never probably going to speak to again and so that's that, that's that, that was as i was thinking about that that was i wouldn't i wouldn't treat my brother i wouldn't do any of those things to my brother to the point of if he wanted consoling I'd, and he was just being soft and wasn't taking responsibility, I'd tell him. And that would be the value that I'd be giving him versus, um, you know, just sucking up to him and letting him, not that he does get depressed or like uh, moans about stuff. But I said with my dad, my dad, so I'm, I'm an optimist. This is a good example. So I'm an optimist. My dad's a pessimist. Whenever he's super pessimistic about anything, I call him out on it. So I suppose I'm contradicting myself here if that's being confrontational which you told me not to do as well but it's less of a confrontation it's more of just uh, be like ex sharing the reality versus how to describe it i guess what most of the things you described then nigel it's adding a layer of emotion to things is our job to be more analytical and to not layer on emotion and so not push people into making emotional decisions which can be, you know, good or bad. No, I think it's, I think it's that um, recognizing that uh, our offering solves an external problem, a suture spin or a robot that went down or um, wh whatever it is, it solves an external problem. But the reason they're going to say yes is because of an internal problem, because of how it makes them feel. Because if they don't, bring down suture spin, they might lose their job. And I'm saying go there versus staying at the external problem layer. And maybe, you know, it, it's the way that you framed it about just being reasonable. That, that's certainly an element of that. I think it's a little bit more complex and it's more of their, 
is always an expert in this conversation between you and the customer. I don't care whether or not you see yourself, the salesperson, as an expert or not. But you're making a dangerous mistake if you don't always consider your customer as the expert. Because there is no way you possibly understand their problems to the extent at which they do. They are the experts on their problem. And if you don't understand that, you're missing it. So is our goal then to coach them, set, like almost like a, a psychiatrist of coaching themselves, our goal is to help them learn what the problem is themselves, uncover it, and then we're just facilitating that process versus we're telling them what it is and disagreeing with them or sucking up to them to achieve the same job. That's it. That's the essence. Love it. It's like a, it's like a weight loss coach. You mean to tell me you think that you think every one of your patients doesn't know they need to lose weight? Of course. Your job's not to tell them that. So salespeople, your job is not to tell them they need to use your product. They may think they do. Our job is just to guide them along the journey of them deciding whether or not they need it right now. So in that case, coming back to the very essence of the show, are we almost aiming for resistance because if there's no resistance there's been no breakthroughs there's been no discoveries and so can we reframe resistance as a positive thing when they're when we're not challenging them and and bring up resistance but they're challenging their own ideas and their own status quo is that is that a positive thing when we're speaking to potential customers when you hear resistance it should set off like dollar signs <laughs> alarm bell whatever it is that is a positive kind of emoticon for you. Ding, 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 because that's where we're going. Before, if you go through a conversation and you don't get any resistance, that should be red flags because they're not qualified. You're going to get to the end of that deal and realize you are not meeting with the decision maker. So Sim simple as that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to dive, dive deeper in it, but that's really elegant in itself, which is a good takeaway for the, the whole episode. But if we don't uncover it, how do we know when to stop? Is this is this the when we turn it into a long term project of if we don't uncover uncover if we don't uncover it in the first conversation, then we schedule the next conversation, then the next conversation perhaps is we come back to them in six months, then another six months, and then they're in our CRM forever from that perspective. Is that how we should go about it? No, I I, I don't think you go on. Uh indefinitely in, until you find that resistance. I mean, th I think that what I'm, let's not lose sight of the essence of and like the art of a deal. The art of a deal is ask them to buy. <laughs> so if, if, if you're going about your diligence process and your discovery and you're not getting resistance and you haven't asked them yet to buy, well, let's start there. So let, let's go back to, okay, Mr. Customer, I need your credit card information. If you don't get resistance there, then what, there's no problem. You overcame it. It it, did, it never showed up. Do we make do we make the things too complicated? And I'll just I'll, I'll preframe the, the the question with this: of the last two or three deals I've done, the past two have been for the for the sales and podcasts, the sponsorships, and the live content have been reasonable six figure deals. And obviously, it's going up and up over the years that the show is growing. And every single time, I've had no resistance. There's no one's ever questioned the price. So clearly, I'm undercharging people. Um and and I'm almost justifying it in myself of, well, building relationships, um, whereas maybe I should, and th this is a conversation for another time of um, the value that I think I'm giving and the mindset side of that. But I, I sometimes I'm almost, it's almost a, an act of self-sabotage of I'll go back when there's no resistance and I'll still be trying to find some. And it's just, it's just been a good deal. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just worked for both parties and I should just shut the hell up and, and get on with it, right? I think you said it. <laughs> well, Nigel, look, I've got one question, mate, to ask everyone that comes on the show, so we'll wrap up with this. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? As your, so this is, this is, a, this is something that is, I think, really present, uh, at least for me when I was young, but it's going to play out for the rest of my life. And I think a lot of people that are listening will appreciate this. Um, and, and I don't know exactly who said it, but I'm going to take it from a book I read 
from Ryan Holiday. He wrote, Ego is the Enemy, and I heard it in that book. As your island of knowledge expands, so does your ocean of ignorance. And I think as we're, as we're younger and we're selling, we think we know a lot. We know a lot compared to what we knew last week or last year. But we know nothing. <laughs> and when you say that, are you talking about the industry, the product, just business acronym? Because I know for me, I was first real sales role and immediately I was dealing with financial directors and trying to speak financial lingo with them. Is it is it just the is it just business or is it is it life and experience? What what does this apply to or is it just all of the above? Gosh, I wish it was just business, but it's everything. I mean, you you don't know anything about yourself. And let's face it, we're bringing our whole self to these sales meetings. We're bringing our insecurity, uh, how we're trying to prove something to mom or dad or a coach or the other person that didn't hire us or the person that just fired us and now we're coming to – so we bring all this junk to these meetings and into uh, and, and our role and to our life and – we don't know that. It takes us a long time to figure that out. And then that person has all their junk that they're bringing to the meeting. And then your boss has his junk. So there's all this stuff. And then, oh, by the way, the business is always changing. Competitive landscape is volatile as ever. You just know nothing. <laughs> and was this was this a, a discovery that came with age and experience? It Was this a moment reading um, that Ryan Holiday book that you just had that clarify moment and a light bulb came on? How, how was this uncovered for you? It's been a process, but I've never heard it said quite so succinctly as in as in Ryan's book, Ego is the Enemy. Yeah, I, I, I like a similar process from Seth Godin's The Dip of essentially you start off with, uh, so it's a graph going up for everyone who's listening on the audio, and then it goes down, then you end up higher up than where you were originally. And you have this initial, everyone will have had this. The whole golf industry is based upon this of people get excited, spend a crap ton of money on clubs, then never use them again. Um, it's billions of dollars a year in most industries that are spent, uh, which comes in from newcomers versus the higher end, um, kind of the hobby side of things. But you're dead excited, you've got loads of motivation, you make quick progress at first. And so, you know, in sales and context, you perhaps go from nothing to getting a few meetings to closing one or two deals. And then you start to realize that you're just a kind of a small fish in a big pond and your motivation decreases. But then to get back up above where the average line is, you have to just persist and persist and persist and pick up those that business knowledge. And for me, dealing with the CFOs in the NHS here in the UK, it was literally just spending hours with that company, my own company's CFO, asking him questions, what the hell all these acronyms mean that they keep throwing at me to probably try and trip me up a little bit and to test me. And then at this point, though, the motivation's lacking because you're not seeing as fast a progress as what you were. But once you get past the dip, once you get above the point of the initial motivation, that's where you become a, a real expert in your space. That's where people come to you because you are an expert. That's where all the, the spoils of uh, sales and business are. And I really like that model. And it's kind of similar to what you're describing of you don't know, you don't know, what's the saying? You don't know what you don't know. Something along those lines. That's right. Good man. Well, with that, Nigel, tell us a little bit more where we can find out about you. And then I believe you've got um, a worksheet to help out the audience and to, to clarify some of these points as well. So Yeah. So we, we kind of ran out of time here. I was going to offer up uh, some more appropriate responses, but I'm just going to give a couple because I think it's a good way to kind of incorporate uh, the worksheet. So like, for instance, the the consulting piece, cause I know that a lot of people, at least in, in when I've done previous workshops, I go in and train sales teams or I'm working with a coaching session one-on-one -on -one and the, the rep finds themselves to be you know, one, the consulting is one of their strengths. So what, what I say, um, instead of like that old response of, well, did you, you know, when they said our, our new robot broke down yesterday during surgery, instead of just giving them what you would do, well, did you call the manufacturer's rep? I think a better response is just a broken robot can create serious problems for a surgical procedure. It keeps them on track. It shows authority. You're telling them you know how big of a problem it is. It shows empathy that you get that it's disrupting their day. And it allows them that if they want to keep talking about it, we will keep talking about it. Uh, and, and then one more, and this is on the combating. I don't know if this service is actually saving us money. So there's a potential resistance to 
who may not want to do it, then you say, instead of saying, sure it is, or showing, pulling out some research paper or white paper, just say, let me understand, you aren't sure the service is living up to your expectations. What we're doing is we're saying it back to them in our own words, but they're having to hear what they said. And to your point earlier, it does cause them to think because maybe they don't mean that. Or maybe they want to offer it in a different way. So I, I like responses, Will, that show authority, they show empathy, and they don't derail the customer. And so what I, what I want everybody to do here is if you, if you work, if you're in a sales rep role, uh, or if you're a manager and you have a team, I've done the hard work for you. I've taken this content, put it together in a long form article on my website. Uh, it's findevergreen.com. You can go listen to it. And then at the end, and Will's probably going to put it up for you in the show notes, we've created this worksheet that allows you to think about how are you standing in the way of closing your own deals? Of those eight common responses that we're all guilty of, which do you tend to go to more often than others. And then let's create a new response. And if we have a team of people that consistently make the same mistake, let's as a sales team come up with how we're going to respond to common objections, common sources of resistance to our offering. And I think what you'll find is that your customers will see you not only as a better listener, but really as an extension of their business. They really are going to see you as adding value. And uh, that that's what I would offer to them. That's where you can find more about me. Uh, I, I post every couple of weeks or so, and it's really tactical stuff uh, that will help the selling pro like you and me just stay in the game longer. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes. And just one question on that, and you can give me perhaps a percentage would be a quick way to just wrap it up, but what – what percentage of our responses are just pre-programmed, like blur and being sick in the, the face of the prospect with just regurgitated nonsense versus what we, a, a, a thought out question, for example. And what I mean by that is how often are we just using patterns to sell? which need updating, changing, and how often do you feel that we, we actually are processing what, what's being said on both ends? Well, if I were to give you a statistic, I, I would be uh, falling guilty to uh, tricking bad response <laughs> number four. So I'm not going to do that. What I will say is I, I don't know. I feel like I tend to get into to patterns. I tend to get into um, a groove Things become comfortable, and that's where it gets really dangerous for me to stop listening because I've already programmed what I'm going to say. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's that's a challenge that a lot of people can relate to. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you for that. And with that, Nigel, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast. I want to thank you for your insights on this because some of it is quite counterintuitive, so I appreciate that. It, it kind of it appreciates the challenge of sale and things like that, but adds a little bit of nuance to it. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us on the show. Well, it's been my pleasure. 